Did you ever stop to think when you see a train go by How it was built and how it got its name For now we have the streamliners, and Lord how they fly Now listen to my story of the train A train has a story that's got to be told Makes real what once was just a dream When you hear the whistle, it still stirs your soul For a train is much more than a machine For a train is much more than a machine For more than a hundred years, Americans have been singing about their trains. From their earliest beginnings, they were the nation's pride. Who could resist these appealing machines? For all their fragile appearance, they sparked a dream of distance conquered, new lands made populous. The promise became a fact. It is our history. The trains grew in size and power, in speed. They spread throughout the land. They moved the people and their goods, tamed the prairies, created new towns, gave life to new cities. They connected the east to the west. They brought the nation together. The train, the engineer and his sturdy crew, they were heroes in our land. This is the story of the railroads. It is the chronicle of what they accomplished in their time. Our focus is their history rather than the present. The future of train travel is in dispute, but the past is undeniable. The glorious, riotous past of the Iron Horse. A train is our history. The story of this land is part of this country's moving force. It didn't come easy, it was built by callous hands. It's the ballad of the Iron Horse. This is the ballad of the Iron Horse. The American continent hardly could have been settled without the help of the railroads. It was their golden hour. Even by the end of the Civil War, there were virtually no settlements between Independence, Missouri and California. Fully one-third of the continent was still an unsettled land. An area of sagebrush, alkali dust, the home of the prairie dog and the buffalo. From the Nebraska Territory to the Sierras, the Indians wandered it and called it their own. Since the 1840s, more than 55,000 people had crossed it. They were bound for Oregon and for California. Four months for those who made it. By 1850, there was a stagecoach service, Independence, Missouri to San Francisco. 2,700 miles in 25 days. It carried the mails and a few hardy souls. Four weeks of kidney jolting, bone cracking, and vile, vile accommodations. Knees lock, back will not straighten. Indians on the hill, bandits in the bushes. Read about it. Don't try it. By 1860, the Pony Express carried the mail from St. Joseph to Sacramento in eight days. There was a fast turnover in riders and advertisements read, Wanted. Wiry, skinny fellows anxious for adventure, willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred. But it was not enough. The nation's destiny could not be fulfilled by leaving it in two parts, separated by an emptiness in between. What was needed was a solid link across this forbidding wilderness, a substantial road for progress, settlers, trade. What was needed was a transcontinental railroad. It would be a railroad such as no one had ever built through 2,000 miles of wilderness. Each railroad tie, each rail, every piece of equipment would have to be dragged to build it, but built it must be. So Congress decided that a railway line would begin in the Nebraska Territory, while another would start in Sacramento, and that the two would meet somewhere in between. Fate and politics decreed who the builders would be. From Sacramento would come the Central Pacific Railroad, at this stage a railway in name only. 
It was controlled by four merchants who had never built a railroad before. Mark Hopkins, he had a small hardware store. Collis P. Huntington, he was his partner. Charles Crocker was a dry goods merchant. Leland Stanford, sometime governor of California, lawyer and promoter. 1,800 miles away was the Union Pacific, headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska Territory. In 1866, construction began in earnest. It was a mammoth task. Every bit of equipment had to be hauled more than a thousand miles. Each mile of track required 100 tons of rail, three tons of spikes and plates. There were the workers, Civil War veterans, immigrants specially recruited, mostly from Ireland. The pay was about $2.50 a day and food, mostly beef, bread, and coffee. The work week, 72 hours. Instant towns sprouted along the tracks. A newspaper reported, They call them hell on wheels, and they are well named. These men earn their money like horses and spend it like asses. Each house is a saloon, each saloon a gambling hell. Life is the cheapest commodity. I believe there are men who would do murder for five dollars. Revolvers are in great requisition. Now the rails stretched across Nebraska. Supply trains ran over the rails newly laid. The track advanced at the rate of one mile per day. Each mile was a step closer to the end. Each mile put large profits in the pockets of the money men. Railway building was proving a great bonanza for the financiers. The government was awarding huge tracts of land for every mile of the track laid. It also financed the construction. It was a hard task, a great task. The directors saw no reason why it should not also be most profitable. So while they manipulated the money, the Gandhi dancers built the trestles and laid the rails. They were deep in Indian territory. The Indian feared and hated the iron horse. He saw in it the end of his way of life. Parties of the bravest warriors attacked the line. The Sioux, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Crow. What could the Indian do against the iron horse? It was a hopeless struggle. Never before had the Indian fought a machine, a creation which would not die. Nothing is going to stop it. Not the country, not the Indians, nothing. Except that by 1868, the Union Pacific was broke. The directors had taken too many quick profits. There were meetings, discussions, and then is shorter to move ahead than be going back. So the Iron Horse would continue its advance across the plains. A thousand miles away up in the mountains of California, the Central Pacific was having its own troubles. It was carving its way through 50 miles of spiny mountains of solid granite. Not since the days of Hannibal had anyone tried such a task, and he used elephants. Not only were there no elephants in California, it was impossible to find workers. Every man headed for the gold fields or the silver camps. But California had communities of Chinese. They too had come for a fortune in the gold fields, only to find they were not welcome among the miners. They were industrious, quiet, eager for all kinds of work, so 50 of them were hired as an experiment. They worked with a will. Rather than frail, they were wiry. They moved huge amounts of earth. The Central Pacific could not get enough of them. Soon they were importing them from China by the shipload, $30 a month in gold and their own food. 
By 1867, there were 12,000 of them at work. But the task was gigantic. Then there were the winters, those awful Sierra winters which last up to six months. Snow 20 feet deep on the flat, up to 80 feet in the snowdrifts. Snow slides swept hundreds to their death. So they built snowsheds under which to work and to protect the right of way. One thing the country could afford, timber. And the sheds would always be needed so they were built stronger and sturdier than any home. Some of them still stand today. Eventually, they bored 12 tunnels in a 20-mile stretch, all of them through living rock. They built 37 miles of snowsheds using 65 million feet of lumber. No one knows how many men died along the way. So these wooden tunnels, miraculously perched along the stony mountainside, are in their way a monument to man's determination to make his way. They are the only monument to the unknown hundreds of Chinese and others who died to carve the rail bed. It was in these mountains that they coined the phrase, not a Chinaman's chance. Finally, after almost three years, in the summer of 1868, they were through the mountains. Now the locomotive could run in a matter of hours through that trip, which once had taken weeks and months, that passage which had claimed so many lives. Now the shiny tracks had all been laid through all the giant rocks. Mountains pierced by pick and spade, proven man could not be stopped. Still many miles of track to go, still lots more work to reach their goal, to lay the rails, to make the trains, to race across the western plains. On the flatlands, it was a race with the Union Pacific to lay the most track. The more track, the more land, the more government money. Charlie Crocker called for supreme efforts and on one memorable day, 100 Chinese and eight Irishmen laid 10 miles of track. On that day, eight track layers each hoisted more than one million pounds of steel. On May 10th, 1869, they were at Promontory, Utah, that lonely spot where Congress had decreed the rail should meet. They had made it. One more tie, eight more spikes, and the country would be spanned. How momentous an event. Some thought the last two rails joining east and west should be of silver. It was a worthy suggestion, but it was mechanically impractical. In the end, they made do with a ceremonial tie of polished laurel wood, a golden spike, and a silver hammer. Nothing was too great, too good for this moment. All over America, people crowded to wait the signal of the joining. It was the millennium. Bret Hart wrote, what was it the engine said, pilots touching head to head, facing on a single track, half a world behind each back. There were no adequate words to answer, so they joined the wires of the telegraph to the hammer which would drive the last spike. First ceremonial taps for the golden spike, then the last spike of all which would usher in the new age. To President Ulysses S. Grant, the last rail is laid, the last spike driven, the Pacific Railroad is completed. All through America they cheered, they fired salutes, what a great day. The continent and the United States were one. The Iron Horse had made them so. The 
The linking of East and West in 1869 was the beginning of a new era, a golden age for the railroads and for the land. Railroad was king. It linked the two oceans through open the whole continent. In 1870, more than 100 million passengers rode the trains. Tracks spread in all directions. By 1890, there were four transcontinental railroads, more than 165,000 miles of track, and they led everywhere. They carried the mails to every corner of the United States. Eastern factories had Western markets. Factories had access to raw materials. Narrow gauge railways brought timber from the mountains to the sawmills, or from the mines to the smelters. It was a brand new world. Timber for homes, ribbons for suits. They carried gold and silver too. Made goods appear to the unseen. Made possible most anything. From wool and silk, beef and grain, suspenders for Uncle Joe. Seamen and steel and new machines, gingham and calico. Whiskey and tobacco. <laughs> Even teachers for new schools, you know. To be an engineer. What boy did not dream it, or even what man? He was a figure of fearless reliability, and so was his crew. The fireman, with his bulging muscles and the need steadily to feed the iron horse. Keep up the pressure, keep up the steam. The brakeman, that lonely figure atop the swaying cars. There was one set of brakes to each car, and they all had to be tight before the train would stop. Railroading in that day was not only adventurous, it could be deadly dangerous. Train wrecks were frequent and terrible. In 1882 alone, more than 2,000 railroad men were killed and 3,000 passengers. 45,000 people were injured. There were improvements for safety. The automatic coupler, the automatic air brake, automatic signals to control the rate of trains along single tracks. Eventually, all these would become compulsory equipment. Experience would join with ingenuity and inventiveness more safely to control them. For the trains were a way of life. The railway depot was every town's social center, the place where things were liable to happen. Just to read the labels on the luggage was to feel the wanderlust. How fortunate those people about to step into the train. They were bound for distant places to meet new people, see new sights. Of course they wore their best. To travel was a great occasion. To travel easily, it was a new idea, a new concept. Anyone could do it. Little wonder that people flocked to view the miracle, even if only to see others enjoy it. The spinning wheels, the pound of steam, these are the music of our age. During two hours of comfort, I traveled the distance my parents, with hardship, covered in two months. We did not sleep. Who could sleep when there is so much to see? I want to see everything. Indeed, railroad travel was all the rage. That is, through the populous east. But when the trains left Nebraska and headed west, they were largely empty. There was almost no one settled in that vast stretch of land. And not only was the land empty, so much of it belonged to the railways. So they began a drive to colonize the western and northern plains. Fares were cut for settlers. 
the railroad sent hundreds of agents to travel all over Europe and sing their siren song. It was often more enthusiastic than precise. These northern plains of Minnesota, Dakota, and Montana are much misunderstood. They lie exactly between the latitudes of Venice and of Paris. What more could one ask? Sunshine, luxuriant vegetation, great opportunities for trade, undoubted prosperity. Immigrants came by the hundreds of thousands. The railroads made it easy. Fares as low as $10 from New York to wherever you were headed. Room in a freight car for your belongings. The Northern Pacific even donated a cow to speed you on your way to fortune. Most often the reality was sobering after the dream. But this was a hardy age and these were determined people. Some left the new land, a greater number of them pitched in. The plains grew farms. Between 1860 and 1900, the number of farms in America grew from 2 million to almost 6 million. The population of California doubled, Texas tripled, Nebraska grew eightfold, the Dakotas grew 40 times. The railways did this, this is what they had created, this is what they had done. No wonder theirs was the power. For the railroad tycoons, there was immense wealth. They lived on a princely scale in palaces such as this, amassed huge fortunes. Not all who ventured in railroads grew rich, but for the able, the bold, and the lucky, it proved a fertile field. They were a mixed bag. William H. Vanderbilt ruled a railroad empire from New York to St. Louis. Edward Harriman, an able administrator and innovator, his railroads stretched from Nebraska to California. J.P. Morgan was so powerful he controlled other tycoons. James Hill, the empire builder, the only man to build a transcontinental railroad without government help. Jay Gould, a financier with a reputation for ruthlessness. Railroads had a monopoly on transportation. Eventually, seven combines would control more than 75% of the railroads. They bought senators and entire state legislatures. Their greatest drive was the amassing of profits. In 1877, the railroads cut wages. The workers struck. It was the first national strike in America. In 1894, there was another national railroad strike. Railroads hired scabs to run the train. Strikers block the tracks. It is one thing to strike for honest demands, another illegitimately to interfere in the proper business of the nation. The trains must move. Mr. Gould's income is said to be 10 million this year. Does he begrudge us our dollar and a half a day that he wants to cut it? Federal troops were sent to ensure the passage of the trains. In the end, the strikers went back to work. The railroads had won, but American labor had learned that there was strength in unity. Railroad workers organized on an industry-wide basis. But railroads had other troubles, especially with farmers. Farmers were almost totally dependent upon the railroads to ship their produce to market. Freight charges were increasingly high. Farmers felt this was extortion, pure and simple. The railroads claimed that their costs too were high. But the farmers were not convinced. The railroads debauch the land. They trample over individual and public rights and boast they have the power. There was no control on railway freight charges. There was favoritism. Sometimes they charge one shipper more than they did another. In the 1880s, it cost less to ship wheat from Chicago to England than from Bismarck, North Dakota to St. Paul, Minnesota, almost next door. 
In some sections of the country, farms went into disrepair. Some farms were abandoned. Along great tracks of the great railways, farmers burned corn for fuel. It was cheaper than shipping it to market. It was hard to convince the people of Missouri and Kansas that those railroad bandits, the James brothers, were really bad men. I'd rather shake the hand of Jesse or Frank James than that of a railroad president. I'd spit in his eye. Railroad bandits seem to enjoy an aura beyond that of mere outlaws. Jim Younger, the Wild Bunch. The only difference between them and the railroad is they use guns. Now the farmers began to unite. They formed the... In a nation which was overwhelmingly agricultural, there were more farmers than railroads. United, they constituted a mighty political power. State governments began to hear the loud demands of the farm bloc. State after state passed laws regulating railroads, state laws, but the railroads were national. So the railroads became the object of federal interest and scrutiny. By the time Theodore Roosevelt was inaugurated, already they were under loose controls. Teddy Roosevelt strengthened those controls. The federal government now had the power to regulate charges, rights of way, the continuity of service. The country had put a bit in the iron horse's mouth. And still the trains rushed on, carrying passengers, freight, most of the nation's goods. But their day of supremacy was done. Now new inventions appeared. The automobile, the truck, the airplane. Gradually these took over ever greater shares of the functions which once trains had all to themselves. So much for the past. The future of railroads is unsure. But a nation as large as ours surely holds room for all forms of transportation. The iron horse and all its beauty, it stir the dreams of men. The shiny bell, the spinning of its wheels. The memory of its whistle still echoes across this land and the roaring of its passing still seems real. A train is our history, the story of this land is part of this country's moving force. It didn't come easy, it was built by calloused hands. It's the ballad of the iron horse. This is the ballad of the iron horse. The train has a story that had to be told, made real what once was just a dream. When you hear the whistle, it still stirs your soul, for a train is much more than a machine. A train is our history, the story of this land is part of this country's moving force. It didn't come easy, it was built by calloused hands, it's the ballad of the iron horse.